So our, our next speaker is Alessandro Sfondrini from Padova, and he will speak about mirror thermodynamic beta and that's for ADS3 CFT2. Thank you very much, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be back in Budapest and to be back at IGST in person and to have the opportunity to give this talk. It's a particular pleasure because uh, it's a topic uh, that, uh, like uh, Ellie and also Fernando were saying, you know, so something that we were doing uh, maybe a while ago, for me it was something that I was doing my PhD, the spectral problem of ADS3. Then I let it sit for a while and it was a great pleasure to come back to it together with uh, Sergei Frolov. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, how we get to the mirror thermodynamic beta answers for ADS3 CFT2, which describes the finite volume spectrum of this theory. So the plan is first to review some basic things about ADS3 CFT2. Maybe most people here are familiar with ADS5. So I will try to highlight the differences. And then tell you something about the S matrix, and in particular the dressing factors that were a bit of a surprise uh, in our work. And then I will tell you about the mirror model and how you use it to do the TBA. So let's start with the review of ADS3 CFT2. And I will focus on the most, and nice, uh, most supersymmetric and nicest backgrounds. These have half as many supersymmetries as ADS5, 16 uh, killing spinners. And they're all of the form ADS3 cross S3 cross something else. Something else could be T4, K3, or another sphere S3 cross S1. And all these are supposed to be dual to some two-dimensional conformal field theory with n equal 4,4 supersymmetry. And these superconformal theories are largely unknown, except maybe at a very special point of the parameter space. So in this talk, I will talk about only the planar spectrum of ADS3 cross S3 cross T4, which is, in a sense, the simplest of all these. Even if it's simple, this background has a lot of parameters because there is less supersymmetry. In fact, it has 20, mo 20 moduli. But it turns out that basically only two parameters matter if we're interested in the planar spectrum. This is the amount of B field that there is in the background and the overall tension of the string. And for these two parameters, we have a classically integrable family of nonlinear sigma model. And the hope is that the whole thing is quantum integrable, of course. So let me just give you a broad picture of how these two parameters center. The tension, of course, appears very much like in ADS5. You go from weak to strong tension, and you go from a more stringy to a more sugra re uh, regime. But the B field uh, changes things a little bit. So the simplest case maybe for this auditorium would be the case with no B field, because it's the most similar to ADS5. It's related to the D1, D5 system. There is very little known about the dual. And the tension is some continuous parameter, like the Toft coupling. And the spectrum is not known as much as it is known for ADS5, of course, but we know that it's very non-degenerate and very non-trivial, just like the spectrum of ADS5 at finite Toft coupling. And in principle, we can get it through TBA. The opposite side of this story is when you have the maximal amount of B field. So in this case, actually, you can describe the model as a vessel minovita model with group SL2 as well as SU2 and supersymmetry and all bells and whistles. This is related to the system of fundamental string and NS5 brains. And here, there are some much clearer ideas about the dual, even if it's something that only now people are really starting to understand quite in detail. The other thing is that here, the tension is quantized. is actually the parameter K, which is the level of the vessel minovita model. And the spectrum is very different. It's similar to the spectrum of uh, flat space strings. It's simple. You can write it in closed form. And it's actually highly degenerate. Of course, it's easiest to understand this as a worksheet CFT. But you can also do TBA if you are so inclined. And that's something that we did with uh, Andrea Day a few years ago. And then in the middle, you have the generic case. The generic case has both the parameter h, which is continuous, and k, which is quantized, turned on. And it's very complicated. There is very little that is known about it. It's a rather generic setup. You can get it from the forming, for instance, this side. But qualitatively, it's more similar to the case with no B field, in the sense that the spectrum is very non-degenerate, it's very involved, it's very non-algebraic. Uh, so far, in this case, we know only the S matrix. Even the dressing factors, we don't know. 
So in this talk, I'm going to focus on the case with no B field and tell you about quickly how we get to the worksheet integrability, the S matrix, in some detail the dressing factors, and then how we go to the mirror model and the TBA. If you have questions at any time or objections, just shut up. Shout up or shut up. <laughs> well, you choose. <laughs> That's a, a Freudian sleep if you ever heard one. <laughs> OK. <laughs> now, first, first of all, the symmetries. The bosonic symmetry of ADS3 is SO2,2. The bosonic symmetry of uh, S3 is SO4. And in fact, SO4 splits as SU2 across SU2, as you know very well. And so in fact, does SO2,2 just with a different real form. And the way that you uh, package these into a super isometry algebra is that one SU1,2 and one SU2 end up making one PSU1,1 slash 2, which is eight real supersymmetry. And then the other two guys make another copy of PSU1,1 slash 2. And everything is factorized in two copies which is precisely related to the fact that the dual is an n equal 4,4 theory with a left and a right supersymmetry algebra. This symmetry is not so important for the S matrix. The S matrix is computing light cone gauge, and the symmetry that is important here is what you get after gauge fixing. And you actually break half of the supersymmetries. You are left with four PSU1 slash 1s, which make for eight supercharges, and a bunch of central extensions which I'm just going to write for you. So let's start from here. You have two Qs. Those live in one of the PSU1, 1 slash 2. These are super symmetry generators. And two Ss. These are super conformal symmetry generators. And they just give you a central element, which is basically delta minus j for one of the two copies of PSU1, 1 slash 2. Some positive definite object, which is like the left part of the Hamiltonian in the dual conformal field theory. And then you have exactly the same thing in the right, with Q bars, S bars, L bars, and J bars. It's actually useful to introduce different names for these central elements here. So I call the semi-sum of these two guys, H, that would be the worksheet Hamiltonian, is something which is positive definite. And the difference between the left and the right charges, left and the right T1 charges, that's some sort of combination of spins, and I call it M. And then just like in ADS5, there is a central extension, like uh, Bizer's central extension. Here it comes around as something that couples the left and the right supercharges. That's very unnatural if you think of the CFT, maybe. But it's very natural if you think of the central extension for the S matrix. Just like the central extension of ADS5 is not something that you would naively expect from the structure of the algebra on the face of it. There are two charges, C and C dagger. And if you want to study representations of this algebra, we just have to give the labels H, M, and C, and C dagger, the eigenvalues of these various central charges. So indeed, let's study this representation. The particles are short, meaning supersymmetric unitary representations. So this means that they satisfy a shortening condition, which I wrote here, H square is related to M square and C, C dagger. And then there are some other conditions. C and C dagger are utterly conjugated to each other and M is quantized. And as I said before, H is actually positive semi-definite. Using this relation, you get the dispersion relation, which looks very much similar to the one of ADS5, where M in ADS5 would be the bound state number. Here, the funny thing is that M can be any integer. In particular, it can also be 0. And then you want to study the representation for the different va uh, values of M, like in ADS5. I don't want to do this in detail, but I just want to tell you that all these representations are actually four-dimensional. So you start with a boson, and either you get two fermions and another boson, or you start with a fermion, and you get two bosons and another fermion. It's a bit different from ADS5, where bound states are actually bigger and bigger. This is just something which is always the same dimension, and basically you are just changing this parameter m here. OK, so what are these representations that are actually appearing and important in our model? These are all the possible short representations, but what are the ones that we want? So remember, this is the dispersion relation. M plays the role of the mass. P is, of course, the momentum. H was the tension. And we will distinguish particles that I call left. These are particles that have m equal plus 1, or bound states of m equal plus 1 particles that have plus 2, plus 3, and so on. Then I will have right particles, 
they have m equals minus 1, and the bounces have minus 2, minus 3, and so on. And then I can have particles with m equals 0, and in fact there are two such representations. These are called massless because this dispersion does not have a mass cap anymore when m is equal to 0. And here I have to be a little bit more careful because the dispersion now does not have a mass cap and it's not analytic anymore. It's not analytic when around p is equal to 0. So it's actually important to distinguish the case in which you are one, on one branch or on the other branch of this dispersion relation. In particular, I will call chiral if I am on the one branch and anti-chiral if I am on the other branch. Okay? These are not relativistic massless excitations, of course. The velocity of these particles is not constant, it's not the speed of light, but it's basically cos p over 2. But still, we have this cusp and we have to be a little bit careful with it. OK, so this is the particle content. And knowing this particle content, I can go and compute the S matrix. So how do I do this? Well, I pick a pair of irreducible representation of my choice, for instance, two left ones, and I compute this matrix by requiring that this matrix commutes with the various symmetries of the theory. Or maybe I take one left and one right, or one left and the massless, chiral or anti-chiral, or one right and one left. I do all the possibilities, and I get a bunch of blocks. Now, it's quite lucky because each block, up to an overall dressing factor, which is not fixed just by imposing commutation, can be determined uniquely. And it satisfies the, the Young Baxter equation just automatically. So the only game remains to fix this dressing factor that cannot be fixed just by commutation relation because linear equation always leave you an undetermined dressing factor, of course. It seems that we have an awful number of blocks and an awful number of dressing factors, but if you think a little bit about it, they are not all independent. There are things like unitarity, parity, and also a symmetry between relabeling everything that I call left and everything that I call right, which are sort of arbitrary labels. And these reduce a little bit the number of independent dressing factors that you have. So at the end, uh, you are quite lucky. You have to deal with quite a few dressing factors with respect to ADS5, but not too many. And let me just show you which ones you have. So you have two dressing factors for massive particles. And the only thing that matters is whether the particles have mass of the same type. Let me just talk about particles of mass equals 1 and minus 1. I will do bound states later. So the first one without the tilde is when the mass is both plus 1 or both minus 1. Doesn't matter which one. And the second one with the tilde is when they are opposite masses. Doesn't matter which one is plus 1 and which one is minus 1. Then there is one dressing factor where one particle is massless and the other one is massive. Doesn't matter whether it's plus 1 or minus 1. And of course, there is also another one where I exchange them. Uh, the one which I wrote in gray here, where you have first massive and then massless, is related by unitarity to the other one. But sometimes it's useful to write nice equations to keep both of them, makes things more symmetric, so I just put it there. But only one is independent. And then there is one where both particles are massless. And here you just have to distinguish whether they have the same chirality or whether they have opposite chirality. So all in all, we have to fix these five dressing factors. How do we do this? By crossing. In order to discuss crossing, I need to tell you a little bit about Zukowski variables. It's more convenient to express the S matrix and the crossing equation in terms of these variables. They are very familiar for people that work on ADS5 because they are exactly the same as in ADS5. So this M is exactly the role of the bound state number in ADS5. And this is the relation with the momentum and the relation with the energy. Now, one slightly new feature is that you can also have massless particles. And these relations here become a little bit simpler because x plus and x minus are no longer independent. There is only one x, xp, which is x plus, let's say, and x minus is just the inverse of that. Another thing that you realize pretty quickly is that for massless particles, it makes sense to consider real momentum, but not so much to consider complex momenta because you cannot really cook up bound states of massless particles. So x for real momentum is just, uh, or rather x squared is e to the ip. So x lives on the circle, in particular on the upper half circle. And then you have to define what crossing is. And it's exactly the same thing as always. Crossing sends x plus to 1 over x plus and x minus to 1 over x minus, and therefore also x to 1 over x. And by doing that, 
you can see easily that you flip the sign of the momentum and the sign of the energy as it should be. And a few years back, using this technology, we wrote down the crossing equation, which I'm going to just show you. It's not very important, the form, but I just wanted to show you more or less how they look like. So the two massive phases, they are related. The one with the tilde and the one without the tilde, they are related by crossing equations. And you get two crossing equations, depending on whether you cross here the phase with the tilde or the other one. And these right-hand sides, they are whatever they are, okay? Don't, don't waste too much time. They are not the same as in ADS5. They are not straightforwardly related to ADS5, but they are just what they are. Then you have the ones for mixed mass phases. They become actually quite simple when we write them in terms of this function f of x, y. And finally, we have the ones for massless particles, which also are just written simply in terms of this function f. Now, one thing that you might wonder is, uh, is there some sense in which I can take the limit of the massive ones and get the massless ones? And that works with a caveat, because if I have this crossing equation, where I'm crossing particle one here in the first line, I can take the second particle to be massless, and I would recover one of these equations here. But if I try to take the limit, so an analytic continuation where the first particle is massless, I don't get anything like this meaning that taking this limit and crossing are not commuting operations. I should be careful about that. So now it's a matter of solving these equations. Let me tell you how this was done initially. The first intuition, which was based also on semi-classical calculation, perturbative calculation, was that for the massive guys, it should be a little bit like ADS5, and in particular, there should be a BES, Beiser tedenstein lacker factor. So the idea was, Let's remove this BS factor, and then we get some equation for a curly sigma here, which should be something simpler. It's really something that has a non-trivial monodromy, so still a non-trivial function, but should be some simpler thing. Actually, technical thing, it's easier to write in terms of the product and the difference, or rather the, the product and the ratio of these two functions. You get nicer equations this way. And indeed, once you subtract out this BS phase, you get a simple equation. You see that it's again written in terms of this f for the sum. And for the difference, you also get something simple. I didn't want to spell it out. But you see that now it's not a crossing equation for the difference. It's actually a monodromy equation. Okay, you should be a little bit careful just because you took the ratio. I'm going to say ratio and difference in like completely interchangeable ways. OK. What about the massless? For the massless, one nice thing is that there is another parameterization that you can introduce, which is a rapidity parameterization, where you relate x to this exponential, to the ratio of exponentials. Now, this is still a funny parameterization, meaning that this is not something relativistic, this energy. But crossing starts to look a little bit crossing, like crossing in a relativistic theory, it's just a shift of this rapidity variable. And what is more, the S matrix for the massless guys is of different form when you use this parameterization. So you, think, you start thinking that maybe you can solve this in terms of some relativistic dressing factor. And in fact, up to a sign in the crossing equation, which was initially missed, one gets the crossing equation is, well, looks very much like the one of sign gold. OK, very well. Then the old which turned out not to be correct, unfortunately. And I should apologize because I had a hand in it. Uh, the old proposal was more or less this. For the massive phase, we first put a BES phase, and then we put some bits and pieces, which are basically related to the Hernandez-Lopez phase, or anyway, to some order zero term in the BES expansion. For the masses and the mixed mass, we just use this order zero Hernandez-Lopez-like phase. And in particular, uh, this is justified also by the fact that you sort of recover the sine Gordon phase and the difference form. This was sort of the, the reasoning. Now, when you try to use this to do TBA, you run into several problems. Well, one first thing that we notice is that already when we made this proposal is that not everything matches with perturbation theory, but perturbation theory is super tricky here because there are infrared divergences all over the place. So maybe there you could say maybe perturbation theory might have some problems and it actually may, may very well have some issues due to infrared divergences. 
uh, on the worksheet near BMN expansion. So when I say perturbation theory, I mean one loop near BMN calculations on the worksheet of the string. There is no other, uh, there is no way to do this perturbation theory from the dual in this model. The other thing is that it has strange analytic properties. When you try to come up with one mirror model, you struggle. This match with the sign Gordon at a sign in the crossing equation will give you some strange eyes, uh, which of course mess up your reality properties. And then the thing that really we should have realized earlier, some of the phases actually violate Worsheet parity invariance. So especially this last thing is very, it's quite conclusive that something is wrong with these phases. So you should sort of chuck them out and start over. So if you start over, you can take a slightly different guiding principle. And the logic is that because uh, there are loops, of course, in this theory, when we scatter massive particles, you have massless particles in the loops. And they are going to give you some sort of massless dynamics in the phase of massive particles. And vice versa, when you scatter massless particles, you will have massive particles in the loops, and you will see some remnant of massive dynamics in the loop. So try to treat everything on the same footing. In particular, if there is a BES factor in the massive phase, why shouldn't there be in the other phases? Now, of course, you have to work a little bit to define what the BES phase is when one of the particles in the, is in the massless kinematics or both. But that's essentially just an early continuation. So it's, it's a technical thing. It requires a bit of work, but it can be done. OK. Now you have all curly sigmas. The other ingredient is to say, well, if these rapidity variables are very nice for the masses, why shouldn't we use them for the massive? In fact, these rapidity variables, they were called Q in the Weiser and Anders Lopez paper, and they already appeared there. So we introduced them. They have a similarly simple crossing. It's actually not exactly the same. The sign is different, which gives some very subtle things when you start putting together massive and massless. And what you get is that the physical region for the Zukowski variables, which is the outside of the unit circle, is mapped to two nice strips on the gamma plane. Okay? So this is the new variables that we have. And crossing is a shift. And then using these ingredients, you get pretty nice equations. You see here the equation for the sum is written in terms of differences of, for instance, gamma 1 plus minus gamma 1 minus divided by 2 then gamma 1 plus, sorry, gamma 1 plus minus gamma 2 plus divided by 2, gamma 1 plus minus gamma 2 minus divided by 2, and so on and so forth. All the various combination of pluses and minus. So it's not quite of difference form, but it may, it's made out of blocks that are of difference forms. And this property remains also for this monodromy equation for the sigma minus, and it remains for the mixed mass, and it remains for the massless where plus and minus are for the massive particles, and I put a little circle when one of the particles is massless. So this would be gamma plus one minus gamma two massless, for instance. And now you just need to try to solve these equations, and since they are quite simple, you can try to, for instance, find a solution which is given by some difference of gammas for each block, and that has the zeros and the poles that are predicted by the bound states. And I'm just going to give you the solution, I'm not going to tell you how we found it, so the solution for the sigma plus is given by some function that ensures that you have the right poles. And then the product of four of these functions, phi, for the sigma minus is given by, again, some factor that is there to ensure that you have the right poles and zeros, and some product and ratio of this function phi hat. These functions are, for the phi, is exactly the, the sine Gordon phase. So here I write it in terms of the derivative of the log of the phase, which is very simple. You can also have an infinite product representation for this phase. You can also have a dialogue representation for this phase. There are many ways of writing it, depending on what you need it for. But this sort of emphasizes that it's a pretty simple function. And this phi hat is some new function that we came up with, which solves this discontinuity equation and has the right analytic structure. You can determine it very easily. And you see it's not a far cry uh, in terms of complexity from the sine Gordon one. <laughs> and it's pretty much all you need to solve 
these uh, crossing equations under this assumption that you use this factorization in two gammas. And by the very same functions, you can solve the mixed mass and you can solve the massless. So now you have your completed matrix with the complete phases. You see that everything is written pretty much in terms of this phi, this sine Gordon function. For these massless guys, by the way, notice that the phase is not exactly the sine Gordon one. There is this little thing which had to do with this i that I told you. You have to be a, pretty, a little bit careful here to impose that the phase is zero where it needs to be zero, and then you see that you need to put such a, such a factor. What do we do with this? Well, we can start thinking about the mirror model and then the mirror TBA. Questions so far? Yes. You mean this 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 thing here? Yeah, yeah. So th this is a bit different, but it's also because. So for one thing, this you also have to, uh, uh, to integrate and you get branch cuts, so it depends on which region you are. But you see that in this thing here, you get ratios rather than products. So it's a little bit different structure also because of that. But the la uh, you can expand in the near BMN and check whether it falls off in that expansion, the whole combination, and you get the correct thing. Yes? Can you understand the, the bound state as single poles yes, of the... Yes, I, I was coming to that, X. but yes. So the question was whether uh, I can use these phases for the fundamental, or S matrix and phases for the fundamental particle to essentially fuse and get bound states, and the answer is absolutely yes, and I'll, I'll comment on that in a moment. Okay. Mirror model, and I apologize to the many experts in the room. I will say just a few words. So the basic idea is that we want to trade finite volume for finite temperature of a mirror model. And we want to do a double week rotation that exchange worksheet time with worksheet space to achieve this goal. So what I will do is that I will indicate with a tilde all the mirror model quantities. For instance, H tilde is the mirror model energy, and P tilde is the mirror model momentum. And the strategy is exactly like the one that was followed, say, in ADS5. Just like in ADS5, the dispersion relation of the mirror model is very different, so it's very different theory. There's no question about it. But it can be obtained, just like in ADS5, from analytic continuation of the string model. So you can get this by analytically continuing the original model in a suitable way, which for the massive mode is actually the same as in ADS5. So for the massive modes, before the physical region was outside the unit circle, and these were the strips, in the mirror theory, the physical region is below the real line. And these are the strips in the gamma tilde plane, which you see are shifted. Just one reminder, what it means to be real is a different thing in the string theory and in the mirror theory. In the string theory, reality is x plus conjugated to x minus. You see immediately from this picture that that cannot be the case in the mirror theory. In fact, x tilde plus should be equal to 1 over x tilde minus. And also here, here we had gamma plus conjugated to gamma minus. Here we have that gamma plus should be conjugated to gamma minus up to a shift of i pi. So the reality conditions are different, as, as they very well should be. For massless, it's even simpler, because massless essentially can only have real values, so they live on a line. And as I said before, in the string region, they live on this upper half circle. It was e to the ip over 2, essentially. And that's the real line on the gamma plane. And in the mirror, uh, in the mirror uh, kinematics, you go on this segment here, which is shifted by i pi over 2. And then the orange line is the anti-string or cross region. So crossing, uh, sorry, analytic continuation means going from this up cir uh, up circle down to the line, or from this line up to i pi over 2. And of course, I'm not telling you how to do this because I'm not telling you where are the branch cuts of these functions and so on, but it's a technical thing. Uh, it's not a conceptual thing. It's quite a bit of work, but it's technical. So by using all this, what we can show is that we have a new proposal for the phases. 
and it satisfies all the good properties in the string theory by construction, crossing unitarity parity and so on. It allows us to construct bound states in the string theory by fusion, indeed. And it can also be unambiguously continued to the mirror region. The phases that you get in the mirror region, they satisfy all the good properties that you want. And in particular, they, they satisfy unitarity in the mirror region, which is quite non-trivial, because before, we said the phase has a, a bit which is an S matrix element, maybe some rational function of the Zukowski variables. Then another bit, which is the BS phase. Then another bit, which is the sine Gordon thing. And each of them, by construction, they were unitary by themselves. That's not true at all in the mirror region. After an analytic continuation, the BS phase is not unitary. But the non-unitary the non bits of one per, part gets canceled by the other. Like the sine Gordon gives you a contribution that cancels the part that comes from the mixed mass, the BS phase, and so on and so forth. And in the end, it is unitary as it should be. So that we also regard as a sanity check of the whole construction. And finally, we can also do fusion in the mirror theory to get the bound states of the mirror theory, and that also works. So now we have our mirror theory with bound states and all, and we can do the TBA, which is what I will do next, unless there are questions. So again, just a sketch. What's the idea here? We take the mirror bit equations, we take very large volume, and we try to identify what beta strings we can have. And in this theory, the beta strings are extremely simple, actually, because we can have bound state of left particles with left particles. We call them Q particles. Q is the number of constituents. Bound states of right and right particles. We call them Q bar particles. Then we have two types of massless particles and two types of auxiliary roots. And that's it. There are no strings where you put together a bunch of auxiliary roots with a bunch of other things, like, for instance, you have in ADS5 or in many other integrable models. So it's pretty straightforward. And then the fused equations for the mirror model, they look like this. This would be the equation for a Q particle with number QA excitations in the constituents. And you see that you can you have an E to the IP. Then you scatter it with other Q particles here. That's the first term. You scatter it with Q bar particles. You scatter it with two types of massless particles that you have in your theory. And you scatter it with two types of auxiliary roots. Those are your equations, and then there is more of the same. A Q bar particle, again, you scatter it with Q bars, with Qs, with two types of massless, with two types of auxiliary. Then you have the massless, same story. And then finally, you have the equation for the auxiliary root, which is scattered with all the main roots. The auxiliary, auxiliary S matrix happens to be one in this model. OK, then you can turn the machine of the TBA once you have this, and you can get canonical TBA equation basically by opening a textbook and studying it. Again, I apologize to the experts in the audience, but just a few words. The idea is that we take thermodynamic limit. Instead of having roots, we have densities of roots. Instead of having products, we have sums and then integrals for this density of roots. We impose that we have a finite temperature, and we impose that we have equilibrium that the free energy of this mirror model is zero, is a uh, constant. And then we get some equation for the root densities, densities, which are, give you the mirror free energy or equivalent to the ground state energy of the model. So these are the ground state TBA equation that I'm talking about. Now, I'm going to express right away these equations, not in terms of densities or pseudo energies, but in terms of Y functions. And because of what I said, we will have Y functions for the Q particles. Y functions for the Q bar particles, two types of Y functions for the massless particles, two types of them of Y functions for the uh, auxiliary particles, which are also split in plus and minus, exactly like, exactly like in ADS5. Essentially depending on which side of the cut they fall on. So let me just flash now, or discuss even a little bit how this equation look like. And I will actually not give you the canonical equations, because they basically follow the structure that you saw before. I will give you the form that you find when you already start to simplify a little bit the equations, and a little bit more structure starts to emerge. First of all, let me remind you that the actual ground state energy comes from the contribution of the energy here. Sorry, the energy here is given by the contribution of all the Q particles, Q bar particles, as well as the massless ones. They carry some energy. They are not auxiliary. 
And then we have very simple equations. You can simplify them to this basically canonical form for the Q and Q bar particles, where you have that the Q particle couples to the Q minus 1 and to the Q plus 1. And this is given by the standard Cauchy kernel S that people will be very familiar with. And you can see immediately that by acting with some inverse kernel, you can write a Y system equation type for these guys. For Q greater than 2. For Q equals to 1, well, here you have a similar thing. You have that Y1 couples to Y2, and it couples also to the two auxiliary Y particles here, the Y minuses and the Y pluses. But then you also have another term here, which I put in some function F1, which depends on various Y functions. And this term here is not really important if you want to find the form of the Y system, but it will be important if you want to study this continuity relation and do a very careful analysis. But again, as far as writing a, the form of the Y system, this actually looks quite nice. So this is where the good news stop, or maybe this is where, where the good news start, because now we get to some interesting things that start looking a bit different from ADS5. No, f is just some combination of the other y functions that I'm not going to tell you what it is because it's just bulky, but it's on the paper. It's not, a, it's not uh, just a source term. It, it involves uh, essentially all, a bunch of other y functions. It's a bit like in ADS5 for the, for the um, particle number one equation. But it's a thing that only contributes to the uh, discontinuity and not to the form of the y system. Come again? Is like, like for? I don't hear. Uh, I, 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 we, we discussed this, sorry. Yes, I think so, yeah, yeah. So I, I wanted to, to spend a little bit of time here because you see that now you have these two massless modes with these y functions. And this equation here is something that we couldn't immediately simplify. And it uh, looks a little bit uh, more tricky to simplify, indeed. Ah, by the way, I put some e to the mu's all over the place just because uh, the ground state energy is a bit trivial. You might want to break some supersymmetry to get something less trivial. That's not, you can put, think that this e to the mu's are 1. But essentially, here we start to see something new that does not immediately look like something that you can put into some, some universal y system form. And then, again, you have equations for the y plus and y minus that are all in all not too dissimilar from ADS5. So this is the stand of uh, this uh, derivation. It's a derivation that only used uh, basically standard text to approach. There was a string hypothesis, but uh, there was some study that you know, we didn't find any other solutions. So it was pretty, uh, it was pretty straightforward that there was uh, lit as little guesswork as we could uh, went into this. So what are the conclusions of this? Well, the first conclusion is that uh, we had the mirror TBA equations, and we tried to be as careful as possible not to put any assumptions. So this, this should be something that we are quite confident on and that you can use to check other proposals. In principle, you can just go ahead and compute the spectrum, maybe numerically, maybe analytically in some limit. But you can start doing this contour deformation tick. You can start considering some particular state. And uh, you can start computing how the energy looks like, uh, maybe numerically, for instance. The other interesting uh, piece of evidence, is, of piece of information, is that we had to change quite drastically the proposal for the dressing factors. And uh, the new proposal has really some quite non-trivial interaction between massive and massless modes. So the dynamics of the scattering of massless modes, it has a BES phase. The BES is a phase that knows about massive things. It knows about double poles. It knows about having a lot of cuts inside the unit circle, and so on and so forth. And you cannot do without, we think. And the other thing is that uh, you could probably take a model where you just say, I just have the massless modes, or I just have the massive modes. Maybe you have to change the dressing factor at that point. And that could very well be some self-consistent integrable model of which you can run the TBA machine and you can start computing things. That model will probably be something else. It maybe is related to some other string theory. Maybe it's not even a string theory. But 
the crucial ingredient in order to get a string theory is to have both massive and massless and make them talk. What about outlook? Well, first of all, one can look at those TBA equations, say, well, you didn't simplify them enough. I want to find a Y system with discontinuity relations. And you take them, you study them, you work hard, and you get a nice Y system with discontinuity relations. And then maybe you get relation for the T functions. And then maybe you rederive the quantum spectral curve as it was done in ADS5 and ADS4, starting from the TBA. And then, you know, like maybe you, that could be a way to have very good control on what you are doing. The other thing is that uh, well, maybe you're, you're just happy with the TBA. You just can use it to compute things. The question becomes, what do you compare with? This is the D1, D5 system. It's not the point where you have a Vesuminovitan construction. So it's not completely clear what you should use as a dual CFT, for instance, to compare. Of course, you can always do semi-classical or near BMN computation on the worksheet of the string. But if you want to compare with the uh, uh, small tension of the string, then uh, it's a bit trickier. We did have one proposal a few years back for a non-local Lagrangian that, would, that might describe this point of the modular space of the string. So it might be very, very much worth uh, revisiting it and see if there is some match with that proposal and what you get from TBA. That would be quite interesting indeed. Because that's really something where there is no other way to do the calculation currently. Something which is extremely interesting is this mixed flux integrability which is quite wild. Uh, I just want to give this very nice formula for the dispersion relation. And you see that together with the usual sine square term, you also have a linear term. And that gives you very, very funky analytic properties. That's why, essentially, so far, we don't really know what the phases are. And therefore, we cannot run the machinery and get the mirror TBA. But it would be very interesting, first of all, because nobody knows how to do it. So integrability can really shine there, I think. And the other thing is that. If you understand this, then maybe you can very carefully approach this limit where this uh, k, the Vesuminovitan level, is something. And then you take the h, which is the Ramon Ramon flux, to be small. And you approach the point where you can do calculation with CFT and where you can use either the Vesuminovitan model or the RNS strings or this hybrid formalism to deform a bit away from the CFT, the, worship, the local worship CFT. CFT. And you can have another way, very robust way, to compare and to extend the CFT machinery. And maybe you can even go and see how the integrability structure reduces to the CFT one in this case where you get essentially a, a chiral theory on the worksheet. So this would be all very interesting. So I think that there is a lot of work to do. And uh, I think it is uh, exciting times for ADS3. Thank you very much. Time for questions. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, just about your comment that uh, let's like drop massless modes, red, drop other modes, but uh, why wouldn't you do the same in N equals 4, consider just SU2 sector, and we know if you, okay, classically is everything is fine, is an uh, integrable model, but if you now run your machinery, as you said, uh, you so, will sorry, get I garbage. Sorry, I get, uh, just about my comment of what? Uh, about considering separately massless massive, mm -hmm and getting like different types of uh, results, uh, different types of models. So you can just, in N equals 4, you can't restrict to a particular sector. You know that in the mirror model, all types of particles will contribute. If you restrict yourself in the physical, it doesn't mean that in the mirror they will not contribute. So the difference with ADS5 here is that from the point of view of the S matrix bootstrap, if I put one massive mode with mass 1, I have to have one with mass minus 1 for crossing. And I have to have all the bound states. But I don't see anything at the level of the S matrix bootstrap that tells me that I have to put massless modes. Now, in ADS5, if I put, let's say, something in the SL2 sector, then I say, oh, but then I have uh, SU2 slash 2 or PSU2, 2 slash 4 symmetry that tells me that I should complete this to some other multiplet. And then I have to put the bound states. And then I, you get everything immediately. Here, essentially, the massless modes they live in different representations, not only of uh, uh, the 
SU1 slash 1 that you have in Lightcon gauge, but they really come from different uh, uh, PSU1, 1 slash 2 square multiplets in a sense. They correspond really to acting with some other generator which is not part of PSU1, 1 slash 2. So that's what makes it different. And it's also the reason why you have all these other models, like when you have a DS3 cross S3 cross K3 or uh, S3 S1 or even non critical ADS3 cross S3 string. So I think uh, that's quite a different here. In, in formulating the mirror uh, TBA, yes. you have to formulate first the string hypothesis. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering how s did you search for a complex solution of the, yeah. the beta ansatz? Yeah. So uh, we looked for, uh, uh, well, okay, this is already the, the fuse guys. We looked for uh, complex string solutions and we couldn't find any that satisfied essentially the, the correct reality condition for the, for the mirror model. And in fact, even in the string model, you don't have anything except for these left-left uh, bound states and right-right bound states. So this was, of course, some, uh, I mean, the, the, uh, it's very hard unless you do a very extensive numerical study to be absolutely sure of this. So, that, uh, and indeed, it's a string hypothesis, not a string uh, theorem <laughs> if you want, but we, we were, I think, quite careful and this fits with all that we knew. But uh, if, you know, if somebody does this study and comes up with some complicated solution with the complex uh, configuration of uh, roots and, uh, and auxiliary roots, uh, yeah, uh, we would have to, to revise this. But I think we are quite confident. Yeah, but did you do any numerical studies? Uh, so we did a little bit uh, also in the past, uh, we, we, we also looked a little bit at this, uh, but uh, not extensively, I should say. Yeah, not extensively. Thank you. Um, so I have a question about the physical bit equations, not mirror, mm -hmm. asymptotic. So um, what happens when h goes to zero? At, at so uh, what do you get? A spin chain, something not local. What is the weak coupling? It's this? A, it's a bit mysterious. Uh, let me try to find a good equation, because the first thing that you notice, you can see it from this equation. Well, let's just forget about kappa. You put this, you put this k to zero, okay, and you will see that a small h, massive and massless excitation, they contribute a different order. Like that's. The first uh, sign that something is different. And when you only have massive at weak coupling, we think that we have some spin chain. That's this paper that I was uh, uh, referencing on the conformal filter of the Higgs branch. But we never really managed to, uh, to construct some sort of spin chain when you also look for the massless excitations. Now, I will say something that I'm not entirely sure of, but some of the things that Ellie was telling us about these n equal 2 theories, they don't look too dissimilar to what we would have in uh, a spin chain of this type. The reason being that uh, when you start from this construction of the D1, D5 system, you also end up with bifundamental uh, uh, fields and you can decide how to integrate them out and uh, it should be quite interesting, I think, to revisit uh, what we did several years ago based on what Ellie has been telling us. But um, I think it's a difficult question and I, I don't have a straight answer, unfortunately. Certainly some non-locality is there. That, that's a basic bet. Uh, so, so can you comment on why systems or your OTB equations, but it's very hard to realize a structure. So can you comment it's just like what type of T-hook where something could be? I'm I mean, kind of some graphics to understand what's going on. So I, I would have loved to put a nice T-hook picture on this thing, but I didn't because uh, I don't know. I only know that there are two wings here that you can see they basically just look lines, like lines. But then I, essentially I don't know what happens in the middle because of this equation here. So I don't know how to reconcile this with, uh, in order, I don't know how to simplify this equation and I don't know how to get it into the form of a Y system and to give you a nice T-hook. So it's a, uh, a question that should be addressed, and I think it's an interesting question, and to my mind is the first step towards really understanding then how you get to the quantum spectral curve. Actually, 
what is the meaning of mu of alpha in the This mu? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so this is, uh, I just wanted to complicate my life a little bit and I put a twist in order to make the model non supersymmetric because since we are just doing the ground state energy, there is nothing to compute if you are in the supersymmetric model. So this is some twist of the. So we, we didn't actually, uh, so we wrote the equations, but we didn't do the calculation yet. But in principle, you should see that this gives you the, uh, the twisted ground state energy for the values of mu. And then uh, it should go back to zero once you put uh, mu equals zero. Uh, okay. uh, could you comment maybe on the comparison of the new dressing phases to string theory? You mentioned you know, to perturbative as metrics. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, uh, even that comparison is not so favorable, I must say. Uh, it matches with, so I should say, the calculations again are just from the string worksheet. And uh, it matches with. Uh, uh, Three level, that's fair enough. Near BMN three level expansion. It matches with the, the near flat space expansion at one loop, but it doesn't match with the near BMN calculations at one loop that uh, Sundin and Wolf did uh, around 2014 to 2016. There are several discrepancies, but there are some subtleties in how those calculations are made because there is a, an issue with having a UB regulator and an IR regulator in this theory. The massless modes actually become relativistic in the near BMN limit, and they should be also regulated. So um, we argue, or we believe also, that uh, it should be possible to repeat more carefully the, the near BMN calculation and maybe get agreement. But as it stands, we don't have agreement with those results, even if those results are, to some extent, even self-contradictory in the sense that the, even the final result is dependent on how the, the limit is taken. Yeah, thanks. So maybe another way to test it could be to compare to some semi-classical state which is protected from wrapping corrections, like folded string. There is so a chance it may not feel... Uh, the, the, there, there was some, uh, some work by, well, uh, Arkady and I think also yourself and Ben. So um, I was talking to Ben, it would be very much worth revisiting that calculation. Because if you remember, there was some mistake in one of the original calculations that uh, was never really revisited. So yeah, it should be, it would be very much worth looking into it, I believe. Yeah, so in some cases you cannot really compare because the standard solutions like circular string, they are full of wrappings, but for folded string, it might be possible. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, I just wanted to follow up on Kostya's uh, question about the, the spin chain and, and your answer to that. Um, so I, I guess uh, Alessandro Torielli and I, we got very uh, uh, disillusioned about finding a spin chain once this very nice uh, um, uh, Sine Gordon picture em emerged, sort of a modified uh, Sine Gordon like behavior for the massless modes. Uh, uh, when, when the S matrix and the dressing factors come out in different forms. So it, it seems like it may be more likely that it's a sort of field theory uh, that, that sits there. I should say it's kind of curious. One thing, I don't know, Ale will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we never, we never really understood exactly what kind of sine Gordon theory it was. It's very similar to N equals 2 sine Gordon, but not quite. So uh, that's a sort of challenge for people in the community. There's an S matrix, there's a dressing factor. Uh, <laughs> what's the field theory? It isn't N equals two sine, Gordon. It's very similar. Ah, oh, sure, sure. But yeah. if I could also make like a more general point, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it seems the mo mo modification of the dressing factor is actually fairly, fairly small uh, uh, once you write it in some, some set of similar variables. Uh, maybe on there I will comment more, but it's, it makes comparisons to, to Arkady's and Fedor's and, 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 and others' calculations uh, a little bit tricky as well. That's another point that's a little bit tricky. So <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? We, we, the, the dual CFT2 uh, is beyond mysterious, but it seems that also the semi-classical spring is a bit mysterious. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe j just to comment on the comments. So uh, about the dressing factors, I agree that you know once you know what they are, you say, oh, of course, it's like it's just it's very simple. It's just a, 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 a small change. But once you were, we were staring at, at the old ones, 
especially when you want to do fusion and fusion is not working, when you want to analytic continuation and that's not working, you say, what the hell is going on? I mean, as you start thinking all sorts of things. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to say is that, uh, so there was this study of this uh, massless sector only TBA from which, uh, to which you were referring, but I think that that should be revisited because precisely things mix. And also I should say that in that particular paper where you do the TBA, I think you didn't do quite the mirror TBA, but the direct TBA, which uh, may, I'm not quite sure that might be the exact thing to do, but uh, it might be that, you know, like the massless sector of this TBA equation is not exactly the same thing as taking the TBA equation for massless modes only. So I guess that that's maybe a little bit of my point that um, it's better to take the whole thing and then find the solution for the massless modes than say, let me start from the massless modes only because you might end up fooling yourself. And uh, if I'm allowed one second, I just wanted to a shameless plug of uh, this Young Researcher School and Workshop that will be t taking place in Nordita. It will actually be about integrability on the string worksheet. So it's very relevant uh, to, to this talk and to the most of our conference. And uh, there is still time to apply and I encourage everybody to apply. I will be sending a reminder just uh, in a moment. You should get, everybody that is subscribed to this mailing list should get it. And for students, I should say that we also have very general support from Nordita, the University of Padova, Gatis Plus, uh, uh, Royal Society, and Science Foundation Ireland. So there is some support for students that want to come and maybe have limited funds. So please uh, look into it and uh, you can discuss with your supervisor or you can ask me. Thank you very much. <laughs>